And feel free, of course, at any time to jump in and ask, can, can you explain what you just did there? Or I think you made a mistake. And I have made mistakes, and this is kind of embarrassing. People have pointed out that I think it's maybe like number one in the spring review. I, I, I forgot some minus signs. So that would be the problem I dropped. So, so if you think I'm wrong, I could be wrong. So don't just say, oh, well, he's a professor. He can't be wrong. I've got to change my way of thinking. Be like, I'm wondering if maybe he made a mistake. So that's OK. That's all right. All right, so we begin. So let's talk about area between curves. And in particular, there was a question, well, what happens if our bounding curves change? So let's find the area. And I'll try to make, come up with problems. Some of these will not be very exciting problems, but hopefully one or two will be interesting. So let's find the area, let's say, between the curve. Uh, y equals 1 minus x, and y equals e to the x, and we'll do it for uh, negative 1 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 2. So suppose we want to find that area. Okay. Now, it's helpful to start by saying, well, what's going on here? What's the picture? Well, y equals e to the x, that looks something vaguely like this. Y equals 1 minus x, that's a line. The y-intercept is at 1, and the slope is negative 1. So that looks something like that. Now, on a side note, uh, we are not trying to test your artistic skills. So on an exam problem, unless the functions are incredibly simple, if it's something not immediately obvious what it looks like, we will provide pictures. We, we like to give you pictures. So don't panic if you're like, I have a hard time drawing pictures. All right, so where are we going from? Well, we're going from negative 1, which is somewhere over here, out to 2, which would be somewhere over here. And we want to find the area between. So this is the key, between these curves. So what we're looking for is this area here. And so this is an example of what's happening is that we see their behavior changes. In particular, there's a nice intersection. They intersect at x equals 0. You see they both cross through at y equals 1 when x equals 0. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is you should break it up into more than one integral. So the rule of thumb is if any time you have the top or the bottom function is changing, break it into parts. So in this case, what we'll do is we'll break it into two parts. So the first part will be from negative 1 to 0, which is this piece here. And in that part, we say, well, the top function is the line. So it's going to be the top function. And the bottom function is e to the x, so we subtract the bottom function. So integral negative 1 to 0 of 1 minus x minus e to the x dx. It's this piece. And in particular, the key thing is that the output is going to be positive. When you're trying to find something which is area, truly area, the output should be positive. And then the second integral goes 0 to 2. So we're starting at 0, and we're going to go to 2. So there's our interval. And now we've changed. So the top function is e to the x. So it's e to the x. Then we're going to subtract the bottom function, which is 1 minus x. All right, now a question. A question to you. This part is dripping below the axis. Do we have to do anything special to account for that? And the answer is, no, we don't have to do anything special. It's already built into it. So what's happening is, even though it's down below, because when we're, we're evaluating this, we're evaluating not the curve here or the curve there. We're, we're evaluating the height, which is the distance between the curves. It's already been built in. So when you're finding the area between curves, you don't have to worry, oh my gosh, there's a part of it that goes below. That doesn't matter. As long as you do top minus bottom, it doesn't matter where it sits relative to the y-axis. It could all be below the y-axis. It could all be above, or you might have something cross. And now the rest of it is just integration, and we love integration. Now, the main way we do integration is we take the antiderivatives. In this case, it would be x minus a half x squared minus e to the x. 
and you evaluate from negative 1 to 0. And over here, what you would get is you would get e to the x minus x plus a half x squared. Because remember, this minus goes through. And that's evaluated from 0 to 2. You might notice that these are negatives of each other, not a coincidence. They will be negatives of each other. And if they're not, something has happened. Go back and check your work. And you plug things in. When you plug in 0, you get 0 minus 0 minus 1. Whoop, that looks dangerous. But OK, so plug in 0, get minus 1. Minus, plug in negative 1, minus 1, minus 1 half, minus e to the minus 1. And then over here, you get e squared minus 2 plus a half times 2 squared, which is 2. Then you're going to subtract, plug in 0, 1 minus 0 plus 0. So you get the minus 2 and the plus 2 cancel. Over here, you get the minus 1 minus minus 1. Those actually will end up canceling. So here we get minus minus a half, which is plus a half, plus e to the negative 1, plus e squared, and minus 1 from the minus 1. And that would be our final answer, e to the negative 1 plus e squared minus a half. Now, as a general rule of thumb, if the question says simplify as much as possible, simplify. If it doesn't explicitly say simplify, you don't have to simplify. All right, so there's a, an example of what have to do if things cross. Now, uh, in a similar vein, someone said, well, what if I have to integrate with respect to y? Well, the, the cool thing is that integrating with respect to y is really the same idea as integrating with respect to x. We just chop things into small parts, because that's how integration works. You break things into small parts, figure out what happens in each part, put it all back together, and life is good. All right, so if we're going to integrate with respect to y, well, we need to have some curves. Um, so we'll, we'll just make some curves up here. So suppose we have, uh, well, let's do y equals natural log of x, uh, y greater than or equal to 0, 1 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to e. And suppose I said this is the region we want to find. And, OK, let's sketch it. So y equals natural log of x looks like that. And we want y equals natural log of x. We want y greater than or equal to 0. We'll actually have y be less than or equal to log x. We'll say that. And y is greater than or equal to 0, which means that we're in this piece here in between. And we want to have x go from 1 up to e. Now, natural log of 1, do you remember what that is? Yeah, it's 0. So this is. 1 is where we cross. And then we come up here over to e. Now, it turns out that natural log of e is a nice number. It's 1. So this is our region that we want to integrate. So we say, all right, so cool, let's integrate that. Now, our, our intuition says this shouldn't be a hard integral. We just set it up because there's no tricky things. We're finding the area. So what would it be? Well, we would say integrate 1 up to e. And then it would be the top curve, which is the curve y equals natural log of x, minus the bottom curve, which is the x-axis. Oftentimes, we suppress this minus 0, but it's still there in disguise. Now, at this point, you're like, OK, so natural log of x is not on our list of integrals. All right, so we're kind of stymied. Now, I would tell you we would give you a hint, integrate with this with respect to y. But I just want to show you why we'd be interested in integrating things with respect to y, because occasionally we'll get stumped if we stay only in x. So let's transform it. So when we're integrating with respect to x, we're doing top minus bottom. We want to go with respect to y, which we're going to do right minus the left. So let's talk about these two curves here. This is the curve on the right. What is that curve? Do you recognize it? It's x equals e. And we're going right minus left. All right. So I have this curve y equals natural log of x. How can I translate this? Well, what I need to do is I need to say, what is x as a function of y? So I need to solve for x. So if I have y equals natural log x, what is x? What's the inverse function of natural log? 
e. It's the exponential function, e to the y. So, what would we do? Well, we just think about our integral. We have our bounds. that We go from the low value to the high value. So, y equals 0, y equals 1. 0 to 1. Right minus left. So, that's e minus e to the y, dy. The great thing is these two integrals have to be the same because they both represent the same quantity, but they don't have to be as easy. Some integrals are easier than others. So, for instance, while this integral, we don't know how to do it, not yet. We'll do it in Calc 2. Don't worry. Stick around. This integral we can do. What's the integral of e? Well, it's e times y. Because what is e? e is a number. It's a constant. If you integrate a constant, it's a constant times your variable. Constant times, in this case, y. Integral of e to the y. Now I've made you nervous. e to the y. And then we're going to evaluate from 0 to 1. So if you plug in 1, you get e times 1 minus e to the 1. Subtract, plug in 0, e times 0 minus e to the 0. Well, this is e minus e, that's 0. e times 0, that's 0. e to the 0 is 1, minus minus 1 makes this a plus 1. So that's the answer. The answer is 1. All right, so this is an example of integrating with respect to y, why we would want to do it. And the process is fairly straightforward. If you're integrating with respect to y, figure out what are your curves as x equals. So in this case, x equals e to the y, x equals e. Where do you start? Where do you stop? So these are your bounds, right minus left. But once you set up the integral, the processes are the same. It doesn't matter whether this integral had been a variable where we called it y, or we called it u, or we called it t. The process is then the same once it gets set up. It's the setting up that's important. All right. Now, some people were saying, how do you find these substitutions? In fact, I would say finding substitutions are probably uh, one of the most challenging things to do when it comes to math. So let's see if we can do a, a challenge one. Now, the one I'm about to do, I want to be clear, this is definitely a challenging one. This would not be one on, on an exam unless we gave a very sort of <clears throat> hint, you know, Think about this. Now, you might be wondering, do you feel like giving lots of hints, Steve? No. That's not how I, I like to do it. All right. Suppose you're asked to find the integral dx over x to the 3 halves plus x to the 1 half, and you went from 1 to 3. So it's a definite integral. Now, what's the process? Whenever you're faced with an integral, there's a couple of things. When you have a definite integral, you have a few more tools. You have symmetry. If you have something which is odd, you might get cancellation. But really, to use that symmetry, you need to go from like a negative b to a positive b, which is not what we have here. So symmetry is not really in play. You might have geometry. If you see a circle, square root of 1 minus something, there's no geometry here. And so what do we have? Well, um, we go through our process. Is it one of our basic integrals? Well, that does not look basic. So it's not one of those. Can we do some algebra or trig? And the answer is, uh, it's not so clear. I mean, we can do things. There's not any trig. There's always lots of algebra things we can do, but it's not so clear. So then there's substitution. So we come to the part, where's the substitution to be made? And this is why this one is challenging, because it's not clear what to do. So when you're not sure what to do, you start playing around with it. Now, the rule of thumb is when you're dealing with a function and you're trying to find a substitution, what you can do is you can look in two locations. You can say there's the inside, so that's your g of x on the inside part. That's where you look for a function in a function. But another thing to keep an eye out for is say, can I find a g prime of x? Because that g prime of x can be a, an indicator. How do you make the substitution? So you're looking for something which is a derivative floating around. And if you see it, that's a clue. Now, right now, there's nothing here. But perhaps if we keep probing a little bit. So this becomes integral 1 to 3. Well, one of the things you can do when you have 
things down here, a natural thing to do is let's just pull out what's in common. What's in common? X to the half. So we pull it out. And now we think about these and say, okay, is one of them an easy, uh, shows up like as a G prime of something? X plus one is not so far off, but this one, that's essentially X to a power. That does show up as the derivative of something. So, so I look at this and I say, okay, this is trying to nudge me to use this part, that X to one half, to guide me to make a substitution because that's the derivative of something. And all right, I say, given that that's the case, I have to think, the derivative of what would give me x to the one half downstairs, or if you like, x to the negative one half. Do you remember? x to the one half. So if we make u equals x to the one half, du is one half x to the negative one half dx. There's lots of ways to handle the half. I like to do the, let's just move it to the other side. So 2 du is x to the negative 1 half dx. Now, what do we get? Well, we get this is equal to integral. dx over x to the 1 half is this piece right here. That's twice du. So we've handled this. We haven't handled the x plus 1. So we've got to rewrite that in terms of u, but that's not so bad. How do I transform x into u? u squared. Ah, you should have suspected at some point today. In general, if you see addition down in your denominator, you got to think, I wonder if there's an arc tangent hidden somewhere. Now, uh, I shouldn't have said that. I wonder if there's some mysterious, interesting function to be unnamed yet, hidden down here. All right, have we finished our substitution? And the answer is no, we haven't, because it's a definite integral if you do a definite integral, what else do you need to do? Change the bounds. And the way you change your bounds is you take these numbers here and you plug them in to your relationship. So 1 to the 1 half power would be 1. 1 to the 3 halves power is square root of 3. So what do we end up with? We end up with uh, an integral we can actually do, because this is on our list of integrals that we know. Our list is short. So we can do it. So what is the integral of 2 over u squared plus 1? 2 arc tangent of u. From 1 to root 3. So we're 2 arc tangent of root 3 minus 2 arc tangent of 1. Notice here, I did not say, let me go back to what it was in terms of x. The nice thing about definite integrals is you always move forward. You don't have to move back. Just make sure you keep updating your bounds as you go. Now, we can actually go a little bit further. Do we know what arc tangent of 1 is? Pi over 4. Do you know what arc tangent of root 3 is? The following might be helpful. If you take a triangle, there's this triangle that has 1, 2, square root of 3. Do you know what the angles are? This angle? 30 or pi 6. This angle? pi thirds. So I'm looking for some angle where the tangent gives me square root of 3. Uh, why is the du positive 2? Because of here? Yeah, I'm just confused. Well, because when you took the derivative to go from here to here, there was a 1 half. And so you multiplied by 2. OK, I guess I thought it was negative. Oh, no, no. You bring the power down before you take the subtraction, not after. So if you take this triangle, you say, OK, what angle gives me tangent of root 3? Well, you, you do opposite over adjacent. If it's a pi 6, nope, that doesn't work. Pi thirds, yeah, that works. So arc tangent of root 3 is pi thirds. So what do you end up with? You end up with 2 pi thirds minus pi over 2, which is 4 pi over 6 minus 3 pi over 6, giving us the grand total of pi over 6. All right, so that's a, a little bit more challenging. Maybe we should do, a, should we do some more substitutions? Yes? Uh, substitutions. Okay, we did a definite one. So, hmm, hmm, hmm. 
I mean, this one's kind of silly, but okay. I'll throw it in here anyways. All right, suppose you had that. The integral of 2x sine of cosine of x squared times sine of x squared dx. Well, this is not one of our eight, which is probably not surprising. By the way, when I keep, I keep using the phrase one of our eight as if everybody knows what that, that means. So on our list of eight, these are the integrals that if you see them, it's okay to, to take the integral. Sine, cosine, uh, secant squared, secant tangent. I started with the trig because we're in a trig mode. The non-trig ones are u to a power, one over u, we separate these because one over u is slightly different, uh, e to the u, and one over one plus u squared. That's your list of eight. If you do not have that, don't try to integrate it until you've done something. Some algebra, some trig identities, some substitution. Those are the ones you can do. And I'm not saying that I don't think you're smart. I'm just saying because that's it. That's all you can do. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we make a substitution. So you can do it. One thing you can do is you can just chip away one layer at a time. Another thing is you say, oh, I'm just going to jump right ahead. And so one of the things, if you, you see it, you can say, well, what if I jump right ahead? Cosine of x squared. And what's the clue of cosine of x squared? Well, see, it's a function inside of another function. So that's a good place to look. I don't want to have you say, oh, I should always look for the derivative. You should always be looking for both. And if you ever see something that satisfies both, you're like, woo, yeah. It's a good day because it's like, I know I got the right thing. But OK, so function side of function. If you let u equal cosine of x squared, then what do we get? Well, du is negative sine of x squared. Is that it? Times 2x dx. And we're like, ah, oh, it's almost like they had just planned for that because, well, we did. The only thing is we don't have a minus. That's OK. We'll just do the same trick we did before. So that 2x sine of x squared dx becomes a, a minus. And then here we have this part becomes sine of u. So minus sine of u du. Well, now are we, are we to our list of eight? Yeah, sine's on our list. So we can integrate that. What's the integral of, of negative sine? It'll turn out to be positive cosine. Because sine and cosine are kind of weird in that you know that when you take a derivative, there's a sign that comes in with one of them but not the other, and that for integration, it's, it's vice versa. So be careful. When in doubt, you can always take and go backwards. Now, have I missed anything? Plus C, yeah. Now, if, in case you're wondering, if we just write down plus C, will we get points? You gotta do something. But if you do something, do something and throw on a plus C. At least if the something is wrong, the plus C is right. The other thing is make sure you gotta go back. You see, indefinite integrals are separate from definite integrals. On definite integrals, we had that full speed ahead mentality. You just start and you just keep going, and life is good. But with definite, sorry, indefinite integrals, you gotta be like, okay, once I get to my answer, now I've gotta go back to where I started. In other words, I need to use the variables that I started with. So cosine of cosine of x squared plus c. Okay. Uh, so there was another question on here, which was antiderivative of trig functions. Which ones do you need to know? These ones. Integral of sine, integral of cosine, integral of secant squared, integral of secant tangent. Those are the only trig functions you need to know as far as antiderivatives. Now, are those the only trig functions you, you'll see? No, maybe you'll see something like a sine squared times a cosine. Anything else that you see, what you'll be able to do is by substitution or trig identities and manipulation, you'll be able to get to a point where you can get something that you can work with. All right. Uh, <laughs> We're actually going pretty quick through this list. All right, I'll do a little bit of geometry on, on here because I got some space. So uh, there was a question about circles. Now, generally speaking, how do you handle this? Oh, sorry. Which trig identity do you use now? 
Well, for this exam or for your life? All right. Um, I would say that you should know the following four in general. And when you get to Calc 2, I'm going to add 2 to your list. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. And I really hope you know that one. Because that, that one is just really cool. And it turns out that you can express this as tangent squared plus 1 equals secant squared. They actually come from the same place. In fact, what you're seeing there when you write this equation out, that's the Pythagorean theorem, just expressed in terms of trigonometric functions. And you're thinking, OK, that's 2, Steve. You said 4. All right, I still have space. The other two are the double angles. Sine of 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. And cosine of 2 theta is cosine squared minus sine squared. And if you can get through those trig identities, you'll have what you need. And that's true also, by the way, for most of Calc 2. There's two more things we add into Calc 2. But that's a Calc 2 story. We're, we're here in Calc 1. Um, so there's a question about circles. So one of the things is we talked about how definite integrals have an advantage. There was this notion that you had symmetry. You could also have geometry. And circles, that's a geometrical thing. So one of the questions is how do you know to look for it? Well, essentially what you should be looking for is when you're integrating, if you see there might be stuff here, but you see like a square root of a, of a number minus stuff. D, whatever, okay? If you see something like that, now it's not 100% true that this will always be a circle. But a circle will almost always come from this type of equation. So if you see that, and I should have added one other thing, it's a definite integral. It's not going to be an indefinite integral. So this one is one where we're using the geometry, which means we're looking for a number. That's where circles oftentimes show up. So we can, of course, hide these things. Sometimes we can hide them very well so that it's, it's really hard to detect. And sometimes we're, we're more open about it. So, I mean, we can do all sorts of fun stuff like um, 3x squared square root 1 minus x cubed. That's not that fancy. But you see, uh, oh, sorry, x to the 6. Sorry. You, you see here, if the derivative of x to 6 is not x squared. But if you said, oh, if u equals x cubed, this becomes a square stuff. And it's 1 minus u squared du, and now you've got a circle. So the question was, how do you find the area of a portion of a circle? And here's the little formula. It's actually really fun. You can drive it really quickly. So suppose you have a, a little piece of a circle. Let's call this angle theta. Let's call this angle r. Then the area of that piece of the circle divided by the total area. So think of this as like a percentage. How much percent of the area is in A? Is equal to the angle divided by 2 pi. So therefore, the area is 1 half times the angle times r squared, because you multiply the pi r squared across. So how do you use this? Well, suppose we had the following. Uh, well, let's, let's go ahead and uh, suppose we had, we want the integral from, uh, all right, minus root 2 to 1 of the square root of 2 minus x squared dx. This is kind of like something similar to one of the ones on your, your quiz. What you're looking for, just sketch the picture. You're going from minus root 2 up to positive 1. So you want this part of the circle. And now you're saying, OK, that was a fun story about the wedge, Steve. But that's not a wedge. Well, here's the thing, is oftentimes, you can turn things into wedges very simply. So for instance, what you can do is you can make this little piece down here into a wedge. Yes? It's true. And so find a wedge. Once you found the wedge, find an angle. <clears throat> now, this angle isn't just any angle, because if you do the point here, this is at 1, 1. What's the angle down here? Pi over 4. So the area of the wedge would be 1 half 
times pi over 4 times the radius squared. So that means that this wedge, if you simplify, has area pi over 4. Okay? Now I circle the answer as, uh, circle that as if that's the answer. That's not the answer, but we can use it now. So what you do is you build the pieces up. Wedges are one of your tools. The other tools you have are things like triangles and squares. So let's look here. I can think of this as take the whole half circle. So, eh, I'll put the answer here. If I take the half circle, that's 1 half pi r squared. And now I subtract out the wedge. And at that point, what I have is I have this piece here. But you say, you see, if you took out too much, yes, you took out this little piece we didn't want, but you also took out this piece we did want. Say, so, okay, let's put it back in. So add back in the triangle. But what's the area of a triangle? One half base height, so get a half. And therefore, uh, this becomes pi. This is a two times a half, so that's pi minus pi over four. So it's three pi over four minus one half. And that's the answer. Oh, sorry, it's a little low. Okay, so that's how you can find the area of a, of a portion of a circle. All right. Oh, you're, you're right, plus a half, sorry. My handwriting is so bad, it's hard to tell. Okay. Um, <laughs> Let's talk fundamental theorems. So there's two fundamental theorems. Now one of them we almost never apply directly. So one fundamental theorem says that if f prime of x equals f of x, then the integral from a to b of little f of x dx equals capital F of b minus capital F of a. I, I, I probably shouldn't have said we don't never apply this directly. We, we always apply this. In fact, we apply it so much we never even think about it. So when we talk about fundamental theorem of calculus problems, we usually are referring to the other variation. So the other vari uh, variation is the following. Namely, it says that if I have a derivative of an integral from some constant up to x of f of t dt, that's equal to f of x. Now, what do you need to know? There's a couple things you need to be ready for. One thing you need to be ready for is it might not just be as simple as x here. So they might say, look, let's go and really kick it up a notch. So we'll go from g of x to h of x of f of t dt. Now, if you have that, what's happened? Well, you're mixing the fundamental theorem of calculus together with um, integration. Oh, sorry, together with chain rule. So, the chain rule, take the root of the outside would be f, plug the inside in, h of x, times the root of the inside is h prime of x. That's what happens at the top, subtract, similar thing at the bottom, the function, g of x times g prime of x. Okay. So, that's... Uh, how we use it. Now, how do you know when to use it? Well, there's a couple of things. Whenever you really see this, if you see a derivative of an, of an integral involved, that's when you know there has to be a fundamental theorem of calculus problem. Now, there's a couple of ways that they phrase these problems. Sometimes it's as simple as just find this derivative of this integral. But we like to kick it up a notch or two sometimes. Sometimes we'll say, okay, we have uh, the integral from c to x of f of t dt equals stuff figure out what f of x is. Another thing is similar to one of your uh, quiz problems, because we were working on quiz problems with some students earlier today. And it's easy to make questions like this up. You, you say, okay, suppose I have uh, the integral uh, from 5 up to 4 plus x squared, the square root of, oh, let's see, what can we do? Uh, 144 plus t squared dt. And this is our function capital F of x. Okay, I mean, that's perfectly fine. It's a, it's a reasonable function. 
And the question is, find a tangent line at x equals 1. So this is just doing like similar one to the, to the quiz. Well, if you need a tangent line, what do you need? Point and slope, right? Which for us, to point and slope means f1, f prime 1. And so here's where you see, oh, so that's why fundamental theorem of calculus comes in to this type of problem, because there has to be a derivative at some point. So we may not always explicitly state, oh, there's going to be a derivative involved with this problem. But because if you're looking for a tangent line, you have to find that f prime, that's why it comes into play. Now, there's a couple of things to look for. Obviously, um, if you have the derivative of the integral. The other thing is if you have something that's like, there's no way I can integrate it. Well, probably they don't want you to. Sometimes we deliberately put things that are too complicated for you to integrate, not because we want to, to make you, you know, struggle, but because we want to send you a signal. Don't try to integrate this. If you see something crazy, you should be like, huh, I wonder if I really need to integrate this. Well, let's see. Well, first off, we have to find f of 1. That seems like we would need to do some sort of an integration. Well, what is f of 1? Well, plug in x equals 1. 5 to 5. Square root of 144 plus t squared dt. Which is what? 0. Whenever the bounds match, the answer is 0. All right. So, hey, that's great news for us. Now for f prime, well, we take f prime of x. So we apply the rule. It says you take the inside, plug it in wherever you see a t. So the square root of 144 plus 4 plus x squared squared. So that's f of h of x times h prime times 2x. And then because it's a constant, we could just put minus 0. You could actually work it out, but because it's a constant, see, that's our g of x, g prime of x is 0. Now you plug in 1, and you're like, boy, I hope this is a good number. Well, 144, 4 plus 1 squared, that's 5 squared, that's 25. Uh, then I'm going to times by 2 times 1. Well, 144 plus 25 is squared of 169, which is 13. So we end up with 26. So our tangent line, that's our f of 1 plus f prime of 1 times x minus 1, or y equals 26 times x minus 1. So those are usually the types of things where you'll see fundamental theorem of calculus problems come into play. Um, well, there's, I almost never get a question like this. Riemann sums. Yeah. OK. So, so there was a question about Riemann sums. And uh, so Riemann sums are actually very straightforward. There's a couple things you need to know. You need to know, um, you're, usually you're doing an approximation to some integral. So they might phrase it as find the area or approximate the area under the curve. But really, it's an approximation of an integral. So I'm going to phrase it in that way, integral from a up to b of f of t dt. So what we have is an integral that we need to figure out how to approximate it because for whatever reason, we cannot take the integral otherwise. And believe me, integration is tough. It's tough. That's why we spend so much time on it. And even after we spend all this time, our conclusion at the end is it's going to be tough. And so um, we have to have sort of like, OK, if we can't get it exactly, at least we can get it approximately. So there's a few things to look for which are how many intervals, so you're breaking things up into pieces, and you need to know where to find the point. So the typical points are left, right, and center. Those are the main ones. Okay. So what do I mean by the, the points? So what happens is we'll take the, our interval from A to B, and we're going to break it up into a small number. And because it's on the exam, uh, we know you can't do like 100. So probably it's closer to like 5, sometimes 4. 
I don't think we've ever gone down to one. That would be a really bad Riemann sum. But at the moral is we split up into some small number of intervals. The number of intervals here is determined by, so in this case, one, two, three, four, five. So there's five intervals. Now what you have to do is for each interval, you have to pick a point. And maybe we'll say we'll pick the left. So for each interval, we point towards the left point. I'm just using, drawing the picture here. So, sorry, I'm trying to make it sound like there's a lot to say about Riemann sums. There's actually not a lot to say once you, once you write it all out. Uh, but I can tell you where people lose points. They lose points because they forget to do width. And they lose points because they uh, evaluate the wrong points. And they lose points because they leave the, the question blank. So now, among those, I'm perfectly fine for you to leave the question blank. It makes it really fast to grade. However, in the interest of your grade, I would strongly encourage you not to do that. So don't do that. So what do I mean? Let's, let's make it really concrete. So I want a specific example. So suppose we were going, say, from um, 3 up to 12. No, no, that's not enough. 3 up to 15. That should be enough. Now let's go up to 19. 3 up to 19. There we go. There we go. Now we have something. All right. 3 up to 19. And this is going to be an absolutely dreadful estimate. Uh, anyone have a favorite function that we can't integrate? What? Natural log of x. OK. Natural log of x dx. All right. So we can't integrate that yet. Don't worry. It's something we will be able to integrate next semester. Oh, it's going to be a great story. It's almost like day one. All right. Day two. Day two. OK. So. We want to estimate this. We're going to use four intervals. And we're going to choose the midpoints. So what happens? Draw your number line. Mark down your 3, mark your 19, and split it into four parts. Try to get it relatively reasonable so that we, we know. And when we give you instructions, we will always emphasize how wide they are, 99.9% .9 of the time, we're going to say that these intervals are equal sized. If you look at the technical definitions of Riemann sums, it doesn't actually require that your intervals be equally sized, uh, but that's just the convention. OK, so now the next thing is, well, where are the cut points? So here, a convenient way to think about it is let's figure out the width. How far is it from 3 to 19? It's 16. And how many intervals do we have? Four. So if I want the width, I can take, if you like, the end minus the start over the number of intervals. In our case, 19 minus 3 over 4, which is 4. So that says each interval has length 4. So my intervals are going to be size 4. So I just 3 to 7. 7 to 11, 11 to 15, 15 to 19. I'm adding 4 at each point. So now I know where my interval is, how I'm breaking them up. The next thing to do is to figure out, OK, where are my points for each interval? Now, they don't always have to be the same. You can say, well, half of them will be on the left, half will be on the right. But every interval has to have one point. So the midpoint, well, that's usually easy to find. What's halfway between 3 and 7? Five, so I'm just going to mark that down. Halfway between 7 and 11? 9. 11 to 15? 13. 15 to 19? 17. So from here, we're almost done. So the Riemann sum has the following. It's the, in, if you use the sigma notation, it's the sum of f, x, i, delta i, where delta i is your width, and then f of xi is the point for that interval. I'll call it the ith interval. And if this is confusing, we'll just write it out in the example here. So what are the widths? We've said it before. I'm going to say it again. Four. So again, that's a place where people lose points. So we go to our first interval, and we say the first interval set plug in five. 
then multiply the function at 5 times 4, the second interval, the function at 9, because that's the midpoint, times 4, the function at 13 times 4, and the function at 17 times 4. And what's our function? It's the natural log. So natural log of 5 times 4 plus natural log of 9 times 4 plus natural log of 13 times 4 plus the natural log of 17 times 4. And that's our answer. Yes. On the test. If we can, if we can uh, simplify the interval, can we whip or? Should you, on the test, if you can actually do the integral, should you do the integral? The answer is no. The answer, uh, do the Riemann sum. Yeah. Occasionally in the past, I think we sometimes have like, oh, here's the Riemann sum, and then we can say, here's the actual thing, and then life is good. Um, we're getting close to the end. Is there anything else I, I haven't talked about properly that you want to talk about? There's, there's, there's the, one thing. Uh, I had a question uh, on the homework. It was this question about x cubed, like the integral of x cubed. The integral? The square root of x squared minus 9. The integral of x cubed times the square root of x squared minus x to the ninth. Oh, come on, you got me. All right, all right, all right. You were teasing me. Okay, so the integral of x cubed times the square root of x squared minus 9? Yes. Okay. All right, how would you do this one? Do you see? It's not going to be a circle because the circle would have to have like 9 minus x squared, not x squared minus 9. So it's not a circle. All right, so roll that out. It's not on our list yet. What can we do? We can do substitution. So substitute the inside. u equals x squared minus 9. du would be 2x dx. Now the 2, no problem. I'll move that over. And now what do we have? Well, we have an x dx. Notice here, ah, darn it, that's too many x's. There's three of them. I just wanted one of them. Well, let me pull one off. So I can think of this as x squared times x. So one of my x's is going to combine x dx give me something to u. Now I have the challenge. I can take care of this, square root of x squared minus 9. I can take care of the x dx. What about the x squared? x squared equals u plus 9. So this becomes u plus 9 times the square root of u, which is u to 1 half, and then x dx becomes 1 half du. And then from here, life is good. Because what you've done, <coughs> is you really have moved the, the algebra, this minus, that was inside a square root to something which is outside a square root, and that is much better. And then there's another half out here. And life is good, and our time is up. So good luck on the exam.